Yeah. Um, well, John Judas, I, I hope uh, the, the turnout this evening is an indication that you all know him. Uh, uh, senior writer in the Republic, uh, and I would say uh, among the two or three smartest uh, observers and writers about American politics today, um, uh, consistently uh, uh, challenging, I would say, sort of status quo thinking. Uh, particularly the status quo thinking of those of us who, are, who uh, tend to look at the world from the, from the left side of the political spectrum. Uh, let me just kind of get right into the moment here. Uh, um, it seems like not that long ago that you were, uh, as you wrote a couple times in your articles, out uh, selling a book, uh, uh, predicting a, a big democratic uh, coalition. Uh, and it feels like we're now 41 days away from that uh, coalition disappearing. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> what are we getting? One of these are again, but it's, it, and it's probably, you have talked about it, it will not surprise me if it's a, a 70 seat swing in the House, and it uh, will not surprise me to see the Senate, if, 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 we, if the Democrats have 53 coming out of this thing, I would consider it to be a big night. And it won't surprise me to see the majority. Yeah, right. with lots of uh, with lots of uh, Democratic governors. I think Ohio, Pennsylvania, Michigan. Um, um, and so, and it's it, 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 if I'm going to summarize it, it seems like the, the public is saying the Democrats suck, the Republicans suck worse, uh, and uh, it comes to suck worse of all. And it's, 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 it doesn't feel like a repudiation of democratic policies um, to me. Maybe, maybe I'm missing something here. Well, I, uh, I I wrote the draft. I did the English and my friend Rui did the math of uh, uh, emerging democratic majority in 2001, right after the Gore-Bush election, and then had to uh, finish it after September 11th, which it was clear then was going to uh, uh, at least uh, stall or arrest the kind of trends that we saw. And, and the, the trends we saw were uh, largely demographic. Um, they had to do with issues as well as people and uh, of groups that were moving into the Democratic Party and that we thought by the end of a decade would make up a, a majority. And they included some, some people that that hitherto had not been associated with the Democratic Party, like professionals, um, as well as some groups like, like for instance, Asian Americans and uh, Hispanics that were moving in and that had to some extent always been in, but were becoming a larger and more important part of the population. So, but, but I, I always, I, when we wrote these articles afterwards, I always put a, a something at the end to the effect that demography is not destiny. And then you can always screw these things up. Uh, and um, I, I think that, I mean, to, to, to put it the, as, as sim simply and maybe stupidly as I can, what, what's happened is that under the impact of, of this recession depression that we have, are having and the inability of the Obama administration uh, to do enough about it to withstand the kind of criticism that's coming, uh, what, what you find is that the weaknesses of the Democratic coalition that were uh, always to some extent apparent, all uh, majorities in American politics are heterogeneous. We don't have homogeneous parties. The problem with the Democratic Party, which was that it was a coalition at the top and at the bottom, with a lot of the middle, uh, particularly the white middle class left out, has come to the fore. And what's really happened is that there's been tremendous disaffection in the middle. And to some extent, it's also spread uh, to parts of the professional, to parts of the suburbs, to parts of that that were moving in the Democratic Party. So that you really have uh, right now, uh, as a response to this failure on the part of the Democrats, perceived or actual, um, the possibility that they're going to lose both the House and the Senate. Uh, and I, I think as, as Bob and I were talking, well, you know, the polls don't look good now, but the, uh, 
in, in the past, what's usually happened in 1994 and 2006 is things actually get worse the last week. Uh, there's usually a surge. So, uh, you know, the, the uh, so I, I, I'm I'm a pessimist by nature, but in that I really am prepared for the worst, and it is. I think it's very possible that uh, the Democrats can lose the Senate as well as the uh, House, even with uh, somebody like O'Donnell coming in. I mean, I'll, I'll uh, as a Republican in uh, nutty candidate in Delaware. I, I mean, I mentioned two things that just uh, you, you have the Paladino is behind by six here in the new in my neighboring state of West, West Virginia, which is uh, where the governor was incredibly. Uh, uh, popular and is uh, running uh, for the Senate. Uh, he's now three points ahead of this guy, John Gracie, who's the uh, a newspaper publisher, never held office, uh, Republican, uh, very conservative. So uh, you could see you, you could see a, a, a real disaster. I, could, I mean, I could say more, but you know, it's good. To, uh, yeah, Jesus, I mean, that's good. Great. I, I mean, just, <laughs> let me just say what I what the the model in my mind. I don't think. I, obviously, I don't think that it, that uh, we, we have a situation where if the Republicans come in, they're going to be able themselves to consolidate a, a majority. Um, we we have more of a situation that's like Japan, I, I think, where where Japan has had a a kind of low level recession depression for uh, almost 10, 15 years now, and uh, once fairly politically stable, now very unstable with changes in government every few years. We don't have changes in government that way because we're not a, we don't have a parliamentary system, but we'll have, have the equivalent in Congress continuing to turn over. Uh, uh, until really we get a hold of the economy and, uh, and, and move ourselves forward. Uh, I mean, this one, one may, let me say one more thing about it. My, my, my fear is, is, see, in 1994, when Clinton lost, uh, the, and the Democrats lost Congress, uh, that was a terrible thing. And you know, they, the Republicans were able to screw around with the regulatory agencies and things like that. But basically, uh, the economy itself was coming alive at that point. Uh, so you know you had the basis by by 1996 for a for a real uh, democratic comeback, and the Congress really also couldn't do that much damage to the country. Uh, I think it's possible now to do a lot more damage. I think if you have a, a Congress that uh, insists that the only thing they'll do, for instance, is tax cuts. Uh, which I don't think will really work in this kind of economy. I think we're going to have a slump for a lot longer. We could be looking at a kind of get Well, but it, it also, yeah. in, uh, as recently as 1995, uh, I would say in the Senate there was probably 30 to 40 people, half Republican, half Democrat, that uh, tended to stay between the, the 40 yard lines. Yeah. And you could find Republicans right. to. to uh, to build real working coalitions, uh, but um, I, that, I don't see much of that. I don't see, uh, in fact, I don't see any of it. Uh, right. the, the, I mean, Bob Bennett lost uh, uh, his seat in the Senate because he co-sponsored a bill with Ron White uh, that was too conservative for the Democrats. So I don't, I mean, that's part of the challenge, it, it seems to me. That I think we have to adjust to, I think, kind of a dumbing down of the place. And, um, uh, the inability of you know, actually putting working majorities together when it really isn't a partisan issue. You know, it's just right. it's so controversial, it's difficult to do it unless um, it's bipartisan. I mean, I, let, me, let me ask you something. I just, we were talking out there, there's a book called Nixon Land that Rick Perlstein wrote um, that I read over the summer, uh, which just sort of describes the, the backlash from the 60s uh, against the rhetoric of the uh, and many in the anti-war movement, some of the civil rights movement, uh, particularly um, in the late uh, latter part of the 60s. Uh, and all his argument got, it sort of got conflated. It led to Reagan winning in 1966, and Nixon's whole strategy, Reagan won the governor's race in California in 1966 against Brown, uh, and won it big. He didn't just win it a little, it was a landslide win. Uh, but there was, a, there was a backlash against the elites and the opinions of elites. You were talking about it again off stage. I don't, I don't know that, that that coalition, I don't know that that 
capacity of the elites to command the attention of the public uh, in a respectful way has never been restored. Um, and that's not good news for you because you described yourself as a liberal uh, elitist. Uh, but uh, I mean, even Obama drops his jeans uh, in talking to an audience. So, um, but, to, but talk to me about that. Well, I mean, what, what happened to our to our uh, the coalition that uh, used to include uh, the elites, uh, the poor, and the middle class? I, I, I mean, I would go back to the, uh, the Johnsons signing the Civil Rights Bill and saying that that's the end of the Democratic Party. I, I, we didn't have a, I mean, we didn't have a, um, we didn't have a, a, a crash, an economic problem in the '60s. It was a time of uh, full employment, uh, but we had the Civil Rights, and that really drove a wedge in the Democratic Party. You had the, you had a lot of the white South uh, leading the Democratic Party. You had well, the, but the facts have been, but that. I mean, I'm just saying that that's not the same as, as well. I don't know. I mean, Bernstein's <coughs> book is interesting on that point because that was my uh, belief walking into it. But uh, part of the problem was, can be, I mean, Watts occurs five days after the uh, President signs the Voting Rights Act in 1965. Wow. And his argument is actually the, the backlash really intensifies not with voting rights and civil rights, but with uh, Johnson's effort to uh, extend uh, anti-discrimination to schools and the workplace. And that oh, cool. sure, that, but that's 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 included. I mean, that's you know, and and yet George Wallace runs in '64 and then '68, and that's a that divides the Democratic Party. That's I mean, that's the beginning of a situation where a lot of the the, the white middle class starts to leave. And, uh, but, but but isn't it, 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 it push this on a little bit? Because I. I think it's easier to win the middle class over to uh, the cause of extending liberty to people. Um, for example, I think, I think Don't Ask, Don't Tell has become, uh, in, in, in national polls, unpopular. Because it's a, it's a fairness, it's a liberty issue. Whereas equality of opportunity is not a liberty issue. It's harder when you're trying to persuade the middle class that, you're, that they need to give up something in order to have a fair society. That's a harder case to make, um, and they were, it, it seems to me. It seems to me that's where some of the backlash starts to occur. I don't know. I find it find it awfully difficult at times to make a case, for example, in Nebraska for the minimum wage, uh, which I vote for. But uh, it, the, the the fairness and the equity uh, arguments are harder to make than uh, arguments connected to giving somebody uh, an equal opportunity as a consequence of real uh, discrimination being present in the workplace or other places. I mean, there's this conflict, it seems to me, between this, between liberty and equality, is what I'm saying. I think, I don't know, the people. Right. I mean, the, the uh, you know, it goes back to the 19th century, and that's what the, I mean, that's what the, uh, the Republicans will argue, that uh, that you need, uh, that, that, that if you try to do too much equality, you lose liberty. That's, that's the point. I mean, let me, let, me, let me take one. But, but that's, I, uh, again, I don't know how relevant that is to trying to figure out what's, you know, what's happening now or what the continuity well, is. Well, I, I haven't seen polling on this one, but I have yeah. uh, the, the estate tax repeal would benefit in Nebraska, you have about a million households out there, and I would guess it probably maybe it benefits 50. Um, and since it's not going to benefit the living numbers of the household, you'd want to what is this all about? And yet, in large numbers, the Raskins supported the repeal of the estate tax. Um, because what they heard was the estate tax isn't fair. It's not going to apply to me. I mean, I don't think they were misled. They were misled, but I don't think they, I don't think they were fooled by it. So I, I, I even suspect that this argument that, that I hear Democrats using that we should only cut taxes for people uh, under $250,000 a year. There may be a lot of, I don't know what the polling numbers are. On a basis of fairness, people under oh, under 250 may say, well, that isn't fair. I'm not sure the populist argument works. Uh, in, in, well, when, I, when you're. When you're I, I mean, the, the, uh, the classic democratic failure in terms of ta tax cutting, tax raising and cutting was Jim Florio in New Jersey, <laughs> where he really thought he could. Re do a kind of redistributive uh, uh, tax right. that would mainly get, get, get at the rich and not at the poor. And, and uh, I, I think there is a feeling among Americans that that, that limits 
that limits our possibilities. <coughs> be, I mean, what if I become rich? What if my farm right. grows? What if right. my small business? So, yeah, I, I, I don't think that that's the, I, and, and I don't think that that's the, that's really at the, at the, at the, the heart of what the, of, of the democratic problem right now. I think it is more of a feeling that uh, the administration has been too close to Wall Street, uh, that it hasn't uh, gone after the malefactors of great wealth. Um, so, you know, again, on this tax issue, I think it is very, it, it's a tough issue, but I don't know whether that's at the, that's at the heart of the problem right now. Should we, do you think it was a meant to take another uh, piece of this thing? Uh, I think the, the Democrats have had a very difficult time beginning with health care, uh, uh, confronting an argument that the Democrats just want to have the government take over everything. And my own sense of that is that uh, it would have been, we failed to make the case that these extraordinary times, and I'm saying, again, before I came in, I do not wish for this, but it, for, for a democratic agenda, it might have been better for McCain to win, um, because you'd have, because I mean that's that's how FDR came to power with an agenda. He had it was there was no question in, in a large majority of Americans' minds that Republican policy would fail, and there's some question about about. It. I mean, they, Obama has a difficult time making the case that had he not intervened with stimulus, uh, that the economy would have gotten worse. Had he not saved General Motors and Chrysler, things have gotten. It's, that's, a, that's a harder case to make. So it seems to me that one of the failures, and you allude to it in your, the, the unnecessary fall of, of Obama article that earned you some critics, um, uh, that one of the failures was, was that we didn't come to American people say, this is a time where you've you, you got to have to have more involvement in the government uh, and, and make the case for it. Because right. uh, it may not have been as obvious that increased involvement in the federal government in health care and finance and energy, et cetera, uh, was going to be necessary. And it also seems to me that we missed the opportunity to say, this is going to take 20 years. Um, because the damage, I don't, in my view, I don't think it was all done by George W. Bush. I think we've got an accumulation of 30 or 40 years of minor investment. So help me with this one. Am I, am I, I, I'm, uh, I, uh, listen, I, I agree about the state and about the government. I mean, Americans have always had a kind of uh, uh, built-in anti-statism, and uh, that's always been part of our makeup. Uh, there, there's a book that I like uh, by Lewis Hartz, the historian, where he talks about Americans as Lockean liberals. Uh, the, uh, you always hear Tom Paine quoted uh, Government is a necessary evil, uh, Jefferson. So it's part of our it's part of our heritage, and it's it's um, it's hard to make the case, and you can only do it uh, uh, if you make the case as well that it's a time of emergency. It's, it's, there's no other possibility, and then by bringing in the state, the government will do things that everybody wants. Um, in in January of 2009, but I, I, I called up for, I mean, my phrase was that we need the fiscal, fiscal equivalent of war. And uh, because, you know, in every, on the, on, when the United States went into World War I and when it went into World War II, there was also, there was incredible doubt that we could do it. How could we get these resources? How could we make planes in that short of time? And, uh, you know, you heard the same thing in the White, White House, and there's going to be bottlenecks and this and that, and we can't spend more than, the, than, than this amount of money. But yet it was clear that if we didn't, if we didn't do something extraordinary at the time, um, we, we were going to be sunk, and we'd be exactly in the position we are today. And my state unemployment just, you know, just went, went, went up. My wife, who's a dentist, is, you know, <laughs> patients are canceling left and right. I mean, we feel uh, now, not a year ago, and it, but it was clear that this was going to happen. Now, the, 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 uh, uh, if you want to argue on, on the behalf of Obama, I, I think what you have to say is that it was hard in January and February for them to make that argument. And it was much easier for Roosevelt in 1933, when unemployment was 
Uh, and also when his opposition was uh, not just the Republicans, but uh, business was even more discredited uh, in Wall Street than it, did, than it was uh, in January of 2009. But again, I think, I think the possibility existed, and I think that there was a certain amount of, of timidity and political timidity. Uh, and part of it just comes from our screwy system, you know, where we have people who come into office who, have, you know, who are, are really new at it, who have these months where they have to figure out what to do, where they're besieged by all kinds of interest groups and experts, uh, and so they, they're not ready. Um, you know, this is, a, this is the legacy of what, I can't remember, what's that amendment where you can't serve more than two terms? My, my oh, the presidential amendment. Yeah, yeah my, my solution, I, I think it's right, not more than two consecutive, but I think we'd be much better off if we had the possibility of keeping well, the money again. How do you feel about the 17th Amendment? Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, it's, it's interesting. I, I, I watch, it's, it's a big Tea Party agenda. Uh, I don't know, repealing the 17th Amendment. And that's a senator's one. Dr. Yeah, yeah, you know, that's I mean, I can tell you, I can tell me why they're part of that. What's that? I, I don't even, I don't understand that one, why they're into that. I well, I mean, the, if you can sort of sit calmly and ask yourself, do you think we get uh, better senators with, yeah. Henry Clay would have been elected in yeah. direct election. I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the senators that we talk about with great uh, uh, pride uh, would not have been, would not have made it in a popular election. Right. Uh, and with Donald Sherbs held would have made it if Jim, uh, and a lot of people that are getting elected today could not have gotten through. No, I don't know if I want to put it through Albany either. But, um, <laughs> uh, no, I, I think there's. Uh, it's, it, it does seem to me that that, that those of us who uh, have no difficulty identifying ourselves as liberals need to really look and examine, you know, what's what really is going wrong here, um, and um, you know, what is it? What, what's it take to fix it? Uh, you know, maybe maybe it is something flawed with Article One uh, in the selection process. I don't know. Uh, I certainly increasingly question whether Article One is sufficient to be able to uh, bring the best people into the Congress. Uh, I mean, the Citizens United decision is as bad as it's been pilloried. As an advocate of the First Amendment, it's difficult for me to, to criticize it. I don't like the, I don't like the consequences of it because I do think you're going to see corporate spending likely on the independent side exceed the amount of money the candidates and the parties are spending in total in this election, let alone trend lines going forward. But so tell me what 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 what's the future for liberalism in America? <laughs> are we going into are we going into, into a dark period of, of bitterness and despair? I I I know. <laughs> I, I think we're going into a very difficult period after November, uh, one, one in which uh, we continue to repeat errors in terms of what the country needs in order to dig itself out of this hole. Uh, so yes, and I, I uh, and I, uh, I, I hope it's cyclical. I hope that uh, 2012, 2016, we'll pick ourselves back up and figure it out, and we'll have a a, a, a real sense of emergency or willingness to do things that are necessary. But I'm not sure. Again, I, I think that the, the Japan thing keeps, uh, worries me. Um, yeah, uh, the, the Japan thing economically worries you. Yes, yes, the example of what happens when you can't do what's necessary in order to revive your economy. Um, well, yeah, if, if you, but it begins with not necessarily knowing what to do to revive it. And my, and my sense of it is that, that, that the, the attack by the Japanese on Pearl Harbor uh, uh, allowed the United States of America to organize in an unprecedented fashion to win a war. But, you know, we, we borrowed 200% of GDP uh, and laid the foundation for, I don't know, 25 years of prosperity up until the early 70s. And I don't, I don't, I can't think of a president that really presented a strategic investment strategy to Americans comparable to what we had in the Second World War. And we've been, we've been running on fumes in many ways since. Um, uh, well, we've been running on what we did then. And, and I mean, I, I, I guess that that's yeah, what my what con then. concern is. If you, if you look at these kind of recession depressions, they're not like 
your ordinary recessions because what, what you really have is, is that the private investment is dead in the water. Um, and by which I mean, uh, well, and now we have not only housing, but also um, industry in terms of going beyond just replacing uh, uh, worn out machinery, uh, old office buildings, building new things. That's really dead in the water. And the same thing happened in the 30s. If you look at the recovery of the, in the 30s, it's primarily public investment. Then you get the war. Then you get this tremendous spurt to a pro private industry uh, through uh, uh, the, the kind of infrastructure that gets built up in the war. You get aircraft industry, all these things. Uh, we really, I think, have to do that kind of thing, and we have to tr trust in our ability as a government to do those kind of large-scale uh, pu public investments. I mean, people talk about the high-speed rail, for instance, as, as important. Now, that's a, you know, that's a 200, 300 billion dollar thing, but even so, besides construction workers, who's going to make the cars? I mean, who's going to make the subways? Um, we used to do it. Uh, we, uh, you know, now French, Canadians, Chinese, it's all, it's all going to be imported. Can we, uh, uh, our, our car industry, there is overcapacity there. Can we shift some of it to making the kind of uh, high-speed rail? So that kind of thinking. Um, the, you know, I'm sure you heard this about the green economy. The, uh, the Chinese are doing, are making all the uh, particular leaves that are going to go into this green economy while we're going to do mainly, I mean, it's mainly going to be uh, construction, retrofitting, things like that. So I think we have to, uh, we're, we're at a time where we really have to do what we used to call as an industrial strategy, but at the same time, politically, we're heading into a situation where that's going to be more and more difficult uh, to convince people of. So that's my, that, that's my work. Did, did, uh, you got a uh, a piece on, what was I, I don't have the date. The headline is The Case for Economic Doom and Gloom. Uh -huh. when, when was that? I don't remember. Uh, that. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I've done it already. So. It happened that long ago, May, May 11th. Yeah. Yeah. It's right. and I, I was writing this stuff in yeah. it's fall. Right. It's UCLA right. economist Robert Brennan, you quote yeah. uh, him, uh, and you apparently he's making the case that we just have global overcapacity in the industrial sector. Yeah. And that uh, solving that problem uh, is so difficult, he doesn't propose a solution to it. Okay. Right. Uh, the usual solution is big war. <laughs> <laughs> no, really. That's a, that was the function of World War I. You, know, you destroy all the World War II, you destroy all this stuff, and you can start over. But uh, we don't want to do that. That's yeah, not, not, a, uh, it's not a good uh, solution. So, I mean, how do how you mean, you also have a hypothetical, you said if the Tea Party were to gain some measure of power, I think that's the way you set it up, and if you sort of imagine uh, what the policy is, and your case is that uh, the economic policies would be decidedly worse. I mean, they'd pay for the Federal Reserve, for example. Uh, well, the, you know, the Tea Party in, 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 uh, in Europe, in countries that have, have a uh, monarchical uh, past or authoritarian past, when when countries get in trouble, they start looking towards that that part of their history for solutions. I mean, you get some examples in Central Europe in the between World War One and World War Two. In the United States, when we get in trouble, we start looking towards a different past. We start looking toward the past when when uh, we were opposed to government. When government was identified with tyranny, the, you know, with the British Crown, uh, and with an anti-statism, individualism. So that's our. That's, in effect, that's the nature of our reactionary politics, and that's what we go back to when we're in trouble. So, and, I mean, my, my simple formulation with this, all this uh, with the problem facing the country and Obama is, it, is if we don't go forward, we're going to go backward, because these policies will just make things worse. So. So is it going to get better with Larry Summers gone? No. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm yeah, not sure. sure. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm reluctant to blame uh, particular people for uh, what's uh, for, for what's going on. And he, you know, he was a, in the White House. You know, people are on one side of one issue and one side on the other issue. Um, well, how do you how do you anticipate? And let's presume that the House and the Senate go on. Yeah. And uh, I, mean, I think it's actually more difficult than it was in '95 for the reasons I cited earlier. Um, uh, does Obama have the political skills to adjust? 
Let me go back to the Summers thing. I want to say, I want to say something about Summers, and then I'll say something about Obama. You want to go back to the offer to go out and drink? Yeah, yeah, yeah. With, with, uh, I, I, when I did this article, I, I did uh, interview people, but nobody wants to be uh, quoted. So I, I, I think I can say this with, without. Uh, it's not a matter of just my speculating or reading tea leaves, that, that uh, in, in that crucial period from December, let's say, through June, July of, of uh, 2009, the key argument against doing a lot and, and also against uh, doing financial reform then, uh, in other words, uh, and doing a, a more aggressive campaign against the people who had committed various kinds of fraud, demanding, uh, demanding, for instance, that uh, if we were going to give money to a, to uh, uh, Oldman Sands or whoever, that the people step down and be replaced. So things like that. The main argument was the old Bob Rubin argument, which was that uh, that, that would destroy business confidence, and that if we did that, uh, we get an even worse situation. I, I think that's false, but that's really the argument. That was the heart of uh, that was the heart of the argument then. And it's not. I mean, I'm not saying it's a stupid point of view, but but if you, it, I think that s for Summers and Geithner, they'll rise or fall on whether that argument is correct or not. I, I don't think so. But again, I don't think it's. Uh, I don't think it can be d d dismissed. Um, o Obama, I, you know the. The, uh, what, what worried me about Obama in 2008 and 2007 was um, that uh, I, I worried again about Obama in the middle. I worried about whether he had the kind of popular touch. I, I wrote something after the Pennsylvania primary when, uh, when, uh, the, when uh, Hillary Clinton won and where uh, Obama's vote was uh, primarily concentrated among uh, the very highly uh, educated and among the minorities. That it was a kind of McGovern asset. That also came right after that San Francisco yes, uh, that's fundraiser where right. you talked about clinging the guns and right. I, I I think that he has I think he has a hard time uh, uh, playing the uh, popular playing the populist chord. I mean, it's not. Uh, I, I'm not arguing that uh, that a president has to be like Pat Buchanan. Uh, not, that's not the argument. Uh, I mean, Roosevelt was a patrician. Um, I, it, it, it's a matter, again, of how you frame things or how you make your appeal and of whether you're willing to, to uh, put blame on certain parties or not. Uh, Obama's not. That's not, that's not where he's at. Um, he's not. I mean, the, the, I, I, I always thought that the greatest misnomer was the idea that he was an Alinskyite, that he was a uh, veteran of, uh, of uh, community organizing. And, and I, I, during the campaign, I went back to Chicago and I interviewed people and I looked at various things he said. And, and in fact, what happened was that, that he got sick of it and that he realized that he'd be much better off doing politics. I thought that, that you know, the most revealing thing about Obama was that and then uh, Ryan Liz's article in the New Yorker, where he, where uh, he found that Obama had redrawn his district, his his uh, state senate district, to get away from the poor blacks and into more affluent sides of uh, Chicago. He's not again. He's very Obama, and I think this is true. Of Hillary Clinton as well were very representative of the coming into power of this kind of, uh, of professionals within the Democratic Party. And professionals again, who who are who include, that include minorities, and women, uh, and the the, the uh, their uh, they their strengths were, were clear, but also we're finding out what their weaknesses are. They're not uh, uh, Obama is not Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton could be both uh, you know he could be both, both Little Rock and uh, Oxford or New Haven at the same time. That was his ability as a pop as a politician. And that's that's really the kind of skills, political skills, that, that we need. And so again, what worried me about Obama now, that, that then and now, is that he doesn't have that ability to combine them. I mean, the, the, his appeal in the fall, uh, just, let me just say one more thing about it. I, after the Republican convention, I, I was actually a little worried, you know, that uh, that the Mc, McCain and Palin would make a real showing, and it was starting to it was starting to appear that way in the polls. 
Now, when the crash came, that was really the end of them because it, if you look at what people voted on, the most important thing that they recognized in Obama was his intelligence. They thought of him as a person who would be able to understand these things. They thought of, like, again, McCain and Palin as simply incapable of doing it. I think that was a, uh, an important basis of his appeal. And it's an important attribute of him as a president, but they didn't vote for him because they thought, here's a guy who's going to fight for me. You know, they always say, care about you. That's not important. You have to, people have to feel that he's somebody that's not just on your side, but that he's going to fight for you. And he's not been able to convince, again, a lot of Americans of that. And I think that that's the political problem he's going to have after November. So, again, I'm, I'm, that's, a, that's another reason to worry. I will have to think of something, uh, you know, optimistic here. <laughs> so, uh, but, well, yeah, I think, it, it, um, and again, I think the challenge is worse yeah. than what Bill Clinton had in 95 because, um, um, first of all, the technologies today make it easier for uh, the, the, you know, relatively benign groups to become uh, a much greater force, which is what the Tea Party's become. It's just a lot easier to get a crowd um, to show up at a particular time at a particular place, and all you got to do is send out an email or a text message. Uh, and if, if, you know, ten years ago, uh, actually five years ago, you probably had to make get a you know a call center and do phone banking and, and call people up and actually hope they'd show up, but not anymore. So I think technologies are dramatically different. I mean, in '95, like, you know, we, you, know it, it, you, you could still find a lot of people that didn't have a cell phone. So um, it's a big difference technologically. But I also think the independent expenditures are going to be uh, huge in this election and very, very big because they're going to. I think they're betting the ARC, uh, and I think they're going to bet on the ARC uh, agenda going forward, um, and it's going to be hard. So where's the overlap? I mean, where, where, one of the things that Clinton did, and he was criticized for doing it, but he found common cause uh, with the Republican majority to, to his benefit. And, and, I, and, I, and I think it helps set the stage uh, for a resurgence of, of Democratic successes in the in the first decade of the 21st century. So, well, where's the common ground? Well, I mean, Clinton's common ground was balanced budget, which was actually, a, you know, a pretty wise policy to follow, given that the economy was booming and we were at four four percent unemployment. So that that was that was fine. Uh, uh, incrementalism, not doing a lot, doing little things, and welfare. I, I don't know what the uh, I don't know what the equivalent is now because I, I would imagine if you have a, a, a Republican majorities in the Senate and House, what they're going to push for are tax cuts and tax cuts that are uh, tilted toward upward, not downward. And, and the, the the problem again is that in the kind of economy we have, uh, tax cuts won't necessarily revive it because the the uh, unlike uh, let's say unemployment compensation or tax cuts you would get give to somebody who's uh, who's making uh, you know less than fifty thousand dollars. They're not necessarily going to be spent. They'll be saved. That, in other words, they'll just increase the problem. Uh, so it's not it's the least efficient way of trying to dig ourselves out of the hole. But I'm afraid that that's going to be. But you cannot dig your way out of the hole. Yeah, the hole just gets deeper. <laughs> Let me give you a couple, a couple things that come to my mind. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think you could make a very good case as a liberal that taking down the size of the federal government is a good idea. I'm talking about just 10% just of the bureaucracy in D.C. Uh, uh, as an example. Uh, I, don't, I don't think there's a correlation oftentimes between what a liberal wants to get done and the size of the government. I think it's possible that you could do an innovation agenda that would force uh, a wedge between those Republicans who oppose uh, uh, restrictions on research and those who uh, support uh, additional research expenditures and, and the policies necessary to promote the jobs that are associated with, with, with innovation. I, 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 both of them I mean, we, 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 
I, 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 I think we could do that. I mean, Gingrich loved the, the National Institute of Health. I mean, it got right. billions and billions, but that's not enough in this situation. That's well, not going to do the. That's not going to do the job. I, did, did somebody actually call Gingrich and Republicans fat Elvis? I, I don't know. <laughs> I saw that. I think somebody did. It's, yeah. it's, it's such a good description. <laughs> I wish I had. Said it. <laughs> Well, but you know, but again, the Clinton compromises, the triangulation was taking place at a time when, when things were getting better. So, uh, without respect to anything that the government was doing at the time. It was so, believe me, it was painful. I mean, we were yeah. having, having lost the majority uh, right. because of it. It was painful yeah. uh, to watch him say, uh, everything but I need a Democratic Congress uh, right. you know, to work with me. It was, right. He was very savvy with that. Right. Um, but it seems to me Obama's going to have to identify some things that would put him on the side, strongly on the side of the American people, that the Republican Congress either will oppose completely or uh, that significant parts of the Republican Congress won't want to oppose for political reasons. No, yes. I mean, basically, I think there's, there's still the possibility for the development of, a, of, of, of an agenda uh, that uh, that rallies Democrats to the polls in 2012. But absent that, it's, it looks grim there as well. Well, this, we got more guys up in, in 2012. 2012 was supposed to be a worse year than 2010. Yeah. It is. I mean, 2010 was a great year. You had more Republicans up than Democrats. Right. And at the beginning, you had all these people retire. retiring. I, I, thought the, I thought the Democrats would, you know, gain two or three Senate seats. So, yes, 2012. The, you, you know, what the Obama people hope for, they keep talking about deltas. You know, the delta, the mathematical sign for change. They don't, they don't, uh, they know that the unemployment rate's not going to go down to 5%, but they think that they'll be able to make the case by them that because of what they did, it's down, at, you know, from 9.6 to 7.8%, and that that's a reason to reelect. And they, I think a lot of their hopes rest on the the and, and what's your view of the uh, the uh, favorability of embracing what uh, uh, the Bull Simpson uh, Commission is going to come out with? Oh, on a deficit direct? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. You know, I, I I'm not. I I think that the deficit is a, a an important medium and long term problem, especially in terms of uh, internationally, in terms of the dollar. Uh, it's not a problem right now. Uh, we'll have we'll do some things about Social Security because of aging. We're gonna have to do some things about foreign wars too. I mean, I think we're gonna have to reorient in terms of the military. You know, having enormous military because that's uh, that's again that's money that just goes out. I'm not irrespective of whether. I mean, obviously, if we get attacked, we have to do things. But a lot of our military is of a different nature. I think that has to be reevaluated. Do you think there's there's a uh, game, and the Republicans have already announced they're either going to try to repeal what the Democrats did with health care or to repeal uh, various portions of it. And one of the things I'm afraid of is that they'll do exactly what they did in 90, with the 93 budget, uh, and that is repeal the, the most unpopular uh, of the provisions, uh, but also the most beneficial. Um, because, I mean, one of the things that, right. uh, that is actually true about health care is if you're going to get costs under control, you've got to do some things that are likely to be unpopular. Uh, well, so. I mean, the Republicans, what they always talk about repealing is the uh, provision that requires people to get uh, uh, health, health insurance. insurance. Right. Yeah. But that's the basis of, of being able to insist that the insurance companies uh, treat people with existing conditions, because otherwise people wait until they're sick to get, uh, to, to get insurance. So, oh, I think that's I think they, you the, the, the most difficult one to vote no on is that one. If, if a motion to, to strike that provision comes up, um, uh, very difficult to vote against motion to strike that provision. I think that provision is unpopular. Yes, I know, I know. <clears throat> but, but it's unpopular. That's exactly but what But it's talking. like the, uh, you know, it's like the, the, the stone that holds the whole church and you pull it out and a lot of the rest of it starts to tumble down. So. But, but wouldn't in that moment, I mean, because there's, there's, there's more with that case on the bill, um, that if you isolate it uh, as a single up or down vote, right. uh, it's very difficult for the Democrats either to get enough votes to win 
for it, will they issue? Well, it, it's going to be hard. They're going to have to fight it out. But that's the. And, but I, but the we argument are, they'll make is that if you throw that out, then you're going to have to let the uh, insurance companies deny people coverage. Yeah, but with the remedy, I mean, this is, as you know, I'm half crazy. Um, wouldn't the remedy be to go further? For Obama to say, look, we, we, we compromise this thing, we got a compromise bill, and if you really want to get costs under control and remove the anxiety about health insurance, this is one where the government's going to have to nationalize insurance. But you, don't have to, you don't have to buy insurance. We're going to remove the concept uh, as, a, as, a, as a consumer good. Uh, I mean, wouldn't, isn't there a remedy here that, because I, I don't think you can, uh, I'm, 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 it's the one piece that I'm the most nervous about, because I think you've got a very difficult time defending <laughs> incremental attacks against the legislature. Very difficult time defending. Right, right. Unless you counter with something. Uh, I, by the way, I haven't found very many people who explain the damn bill. Yeah. Uh, so that, that, it, it's part of the problem is so complicated um, that it's very difficult to explain the connection, right, as you just did, uh, between a provision and something that could benefit the individual. Well, I, I think they're hoping that some of the provisions will kick in and will become popular, for instance, closing the donut hole on, uh, uh, for uh, prescription drugs and Medicare. There are things that are gonna, that are already starting to kick in, the coverage of, uh, of uh, kids since like 26. Yeah. Uh, so there are things that are gonna be on their side, and they might be able to make a case against that, that kind of, kind, kind of um, uh, against trying to take out parts of it. Um, as far as going any farther, I don't see any possibility of that. I just don't. Oh, I think they could. I mean, uh, I think they could eliminate the mandate. I think they, they can eliminate the relatively small uh, increase in taxation of benefits. I think they can eliminate the commission uh, that's been established to review hospital and doctor expenditures. Uh, no, I think there's a number of provisions that, if they repeal them, they'd have an awful lot of people saying that's why we voted, that's why we wanted to come into power to do the right thing you know, for us. Oh, yeah, no, they're not, I'm not saying that, that, that they won't try, but I think the Obama will beat them. At the same time, I don't think he can go any farther. I don't think he can go towards a single payer or say, you know, we've done this, because I think that their whole argument is we have to try this and see. I don't know, that's what I'm not sure that. I think, yeah. but again, we, we were talking off, off before we came in here. Uh, um, uh, uh, there's a wonderful book that's coming out in a couple weeks on Pat Moynihan's letters and memos, and I'm, was given an advanced copy by Liz, his, his widow. Uh, and whatever you think of his political views, an extraordinary writer. And among, among his fav my favorite letters are ones that are very short. So he's got one letter in there to a colleague who's standing for his dissertation at Harvard. And his quote was from uh, Fred Astaire in The Gay de Marseille, saying, chance is the fool's name for fate. Right. So, um, I don't think you can leave uh, this thing to, to sort of idle chance. I, I, and, I, I, and I think that it's predictable what the, what the attack line is going to be. They end up with, with both houses. It's predictable what they'll do on health care. And I don't think you can trump them with, with a veto. Um, I we'll think see. So that's what they're going to try, though. Uh, my, my own sense of it is that that won't make, that won't make it easier for him in 2012 way hard. Because he's going to be out there defending not the mandate, for example, not only is it popular, but he opposed the demand for office. Uh, and it doesn't, it, it doesn't get labor excited, it doesn't really turn people on when it goes to poll, you know. Let's get out there and roll because we, if we win, we're going to have a mandate that we have to buy health insurance. So it's not, a, not an exciting clause line. Uh -huh. So, okay, so give me some reason to feel optimistic. <laughs> Um, no, no, I... <laughs> we're talking about the Tea Party work, because you, you have, you have been un unpacked them, I think, in, in, in a correct way. I don't... <clears throat> who are they? For those, of us, uh, for those of you who may not have read some of the pieces that John has done on them, I think your analysis of it is, seems to me to be spot on. But tell me, who are they? Um, well, I, I'd start by saying that... Hey, by the way, are you going to the John Stewart, Stephen Colbert? <laughs> my, my, I think my wife and daughter are going to go. I don't, I don't I'm go to my office. I'm going to Colbert. I'm going to keep the beer alive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so who are they? We, we've 
always had in this country, uh, at least for 200 years, this kind of... Uh, <coughs> Let me just talk about two kinds of things that make up the Tea Party that go into it. Uh, and there, there are strains of thought that tend to come to the surface again in times of crisis, in terms of, uh, like the present. Uh, one, one is this old idea of producerism that goes back to the Jacksonians, um, that there is a, um, that there's a middle class, the nature of it, of course, changes its mechanics, you know. You know. In the 1820s, now now it looks a lot different, but that there is a that there is a middle class who does the work. Um, what, what what did Clinton used to say? The people who play by the re rules do the work. Play by the rules. And um, <laughs> the, on the other hand, there's people who live off them, and it's seen both on, above and below. Uh, left left wing populism uh, focuses mainly above. At the uh, at the Wall Street, at the malefactors of great wealth, uh, and people who are ripping off coupon clippers. Um, right wing po populism more below at the uh, at, at the idle poor, at the people who are uh, are living off uh, the ill begotten gains. So it's it, this strain of producerism is very strong in American history. It's not uh, it's 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 a uh, it's part of our it's part of our collective unconscious, and uh, it's more important, for instance, for us than class, uh, the working class versus the capitalist class is for somebody in Europe. It's our it's our political frame of reference. So that's an important strain in the in the Tea Party. Uh, it was an important strain in the Perot. Make, made in USA. It was important for Buchanan. It was important for George Wallace. Uh, it was important in Reagan, the welfare queens. Uh, it was also important, again, Franklin Roosevelt, the po populist party, uh, Bill Clinton in 1992, putting people first. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's part of our po political heritage. The, the other thing that in the, in the, uh, in the Tea Party, I, I was always astonished uh, by when I would go to these th things, or you can just find it by going on the web page, this crazy stuff about the Constitution. I mean, they can start talking about. I, I'm not a. I'm not a constitutionalist. They can start talking about Article 14, uh, Subdivision Three, and Article Four, Section Four. I mean, I would yeah, exactly. Well, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> you know it. I don't. Yeah, I, but you, 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 uh, there is a, a feeling again about the Constitution that that I think is again part of our heritage that goes as far back as the Puritans in the sense that we had the Bible as the word of God and of the, of the book. And it goes into the concept of the Constitution in the late uh, 18th, 18th century uh, and, and has been carried with us, the sense that there is this book and, and there is this text and that if we live by that and if we live by its rules, then we will have a good society and we'll live a good life. So I think you find both those coming together in the Tea Party. I'm not the one that um, that thinks that it can simply be reduced to ra racism, white versus black stuff. I think it, you know, I think if Hillary Clinton had been elected, it would be you'd see the same damn thing. It's not uh, not any different. Uh, I, I don't think it's a. I don't think again. I think it's a matter of grievance and of a sense of embattled and a feeling that the, the people on the top are screwing us and the people on the bottom are living off us. Uh, and it's, it's uh, and, and uh, I, I guess what I argued about the Obama administration is that it's just inescapable and that if an administration doesn't talk to this, this sentiment and try to turn it one way rather than the other, they're going to get stuck with this kind of uh, rebellion. I mean, Roosevelt was a very good example in the 30s of somebody who dealt with it and dealt with it effectively because there was a lot of uh, right-wing populism then. But it, he was able to, uh, he, he, would, he was able, in effect, to co-opt it, uh, to marginalize it. That's not the case now. I was, uh, I mean, I did a, a story on the Tea Party uh, in uh, April, and uh, I was going to go to uh, Delaware because I wanted to go on tax day to, to see one of these rallies, and so, uh, and they, and I knew they were going to meet there. But I thought, you know, 
Well, there are only going to be 15 or 20 people, and indeed there were, and then this uh, lady who was running the thing is just a complete kook, you know, Donald. <laughs> so, you know, I stuck with the Dick Army and Freedom Ways and the thing in Washington. It is, a, it is an unbelievable uh, occurrence, I, uh, and it is, uh, it is partly, made, again, made possible by uh, social media and the, uh, well, what that does in terms of the, uh, creating kind of virtual communities. Right, but you seem to be making a case, and I agree with it. I think it's in the state to try to demonize it. I think there's plenty of arguments that they're making that if you come at them direct, getting rid of the Federal Reserve, for example, I mean, you, can, you can come right straight at an argument they're making. Right. Uh, and and win the argument. Uh, whereas if you start at the beginning by saying they're racist, no good nitwits, then you know uh, it, it's very difficult to, uh, I think, to win that argument because there's an awful lot of people who don't identify as Tea Party people who identify with their anger. Uh, so I, I I think it'd be a, and I also think you know the next <coughs> six weeks would be a terrible strategy for the Democrats because it basically would nationalize that movement. And bigger way than it is right now. Uh, but you're going to hear those arguments in the Congress. Because uh, I I, I they're not going to control, but they're going to have a lot of control. They're going to have a lot of influence in, in, the, in the Congress, in my opinion. Uh, uh, because uh, the Republicans, uh, in the, again, you've written about it. The Tea Party movement began as a revolt against Republicans within the Republican Party, not as a revolt against Democrats. And, uh, so, and so the Republicans are, are, they know what happened to Bob Bennett. They know what happened to Murkowski, uh, and they would prefer that not to happen to them. Right. Uh, so, it, and, and so pieces of their agenda are going to come into the into both the House and Senate if the uh, House and the Senate are controlled by the Republican Party. Seems to me. Yeah. Can, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop and see if there's any <coughs> questions from the audience. I don't see any hands. Paul, want to get to stand up. Uh, my, my question is on the issue of financial illiteracy or the concept of moral hazard. At what point does the Democratic Party say we cannot just provide and protect everything and everyone all the time? There are times when people need to take the consequences of their own decisions. And I'm wondering if that does play a part of it or if it's something that is just incapable of being uh, said by Democratic politicians. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a very good question. I got my own answer, but I'm going to let our guest answer first. See if he's smarter than I am. Mm -hmm. I just agree with it. I, you know, it's it's as much a problem for Republicans as uh, Democrats. Um, you you're talking about letting businesses fail? Let, letting homeowners who uh, bought houses that were too big for them be forced out of their houses so people who save their money and pay taxes on their savings can go well, on. I mean, that, uh, again, just to make make it clear that it's not a, a something peculiar to Democrats. In uh, 1980, Ronald Reagan, uh, during the campaigns, changed his position on the uh, on the Chrysler and the auto bailout. So, you know, I think that uh, you would have found in, if McCain had been president, I, I think there are a lot of goofy things he would have done, but that would not have been one of them, to let the, uh, the auto companies fail. There, there's I'm not sure of that. Well, I, again, you know, who knows, but, but it's not the... <laughs> it might be if Tarper, if Tarper up again, it would not get a majority vote, given the reaction against Tarp. The, the problem with Tarp was the, the, the lack of conditions. And transparency. Yeah. Well, both, yeah. Well, it, 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 it is lack of conditions and lack of transparency, but there is a, you know, if, if, if you're operating a business with, you know, a million dollars for the sale, uh, and you go broke, uh, you can't appeal to get bailed out. And so the, the case is, why are you doing it with uh, Goldman Sachs? Why, you know, you know so uh, there is a moral hazard case there. It was one of the most contentious things in the Fed Red Bill uh, uh, about making certain that the Democrats actually came around on that and said, we do have to make certain that we don't proceed with a too big to fail policy. Now, I, I don't know if it's written in the bill sufficiently, but they argued in favor of uh, having a policy that said it's not, you can't be too big to fail. And actually in the housing, there's an increasing argument uh, that the market's got to clear somehow because you get prices beyond... That's the most like Japan. Yeah, because um, housing's still a big problem. Yeah, I, I think you're happy to blame the president too much. And I think you have to place a lot of the blame uh, at the congressional leadership. 
Uh, Speaker Pelosi, Leader Reid. Let me give you an example. Uh, the 99, the extension of unemployment benefits is up for a vote, was coming up for a vote the end of June, the beginning of July, right before the 4th of July recess. Democrats said this was very important. What did they do? They adjourned. They didn't keep Congress in session to get a vote and make the Republicans vote every single day to call a vote every single day on unemployment. Because the elites in the Democratic Party don't understand 9.6% and don't understand 16.7%, which would be all an unemployment rate, and they focus on other things. And it sits in Congress as well as in the administration. Well, you know, I, I, I you can't can, argue with that. Huh? <laughs> I, I don't disagree with what you just said. I think it, there's plenty of money to go around. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, my criticism of the president, my criticism of policy and reach, not because I had fundamental disagreements with him, but because uh, somebody who uh, wants them both to succeed, all three of them succeed, trying to figure out what they're going to, what they're going to do in, in, in six weeks. Uh, uh, was, uh, and, and, and trying to understand what went wrong in order to be able to Figure out how to proceed from here. So I, I uh, so I disagree. So we can have. <laughs> I, I do disagree. I mean, I, I don't disagree with your example at all. Uh, that was a case where, as I remember, where the Republicans wanted to filibuster. You know, a lot of us thought they should just you know keep keep going until. So yes, that that's fine. They do screw up and and uh, probably read more than Pelosi because uh, that's where the filibuster problem is. Uh, but. I think in 2009, you did have a certain passivity problem, uh, especially with the health insurance bill, uh, where, the, uh, where the Obama people just let the uh, let, let caucus and, and this whole idea of a uh, nonpartisan or bipartisan bill, they just screwed around with that too long, and they, they just uh, get, they, they lost a lot of momentum. Uh, I think if they passed the health insurance earlier, they'd be in somewhat bad. I mean, they wouldn't have had Scott Brown, for one thing. But so there, w I, I think there was a passivity problem. Uh, there was a passivity problem with financial reform and not getting and not pushing for Congress to do it uh, earlier, uh, and letting that Angelides commission come about. And one of the one of the things that Roosevelt then benefited for, from was the uh, was Pecora, that commission that. Uh, brought all you know Morgan and all these people before before it and uh, made a public spectacle of them and uh, gave Americans a feeling that the government recognized the injustice of what had occurred. Um, again, that's something that could have happened in 2009 uh, and would have made a lot of things easier. Uh, so I'm not. Uh, again, I think the Obama people always had arguments on the other side, but but I think there was a passivity problem. And the basis of it uh, was, one, an experience, but two, this idea that uh, the, the, um, the partisan conflict of the past, particularly in the 90s, had been the result not just of Republican intransigence, but of the uh, Clinton administration's inability you know, to handle this stuff. And, and that somehow that if you know, Republicans were presented with this greater ideal of unity, uh, that, that we would be able to uh, create, the Obama people would be able to create uh, uh, much better functioning majorities. There wouldn't be this kind of crazy wow. filibuster Senate. And that's, but that's just turned out to be false, and it took them a year to figure that out. Yeah, I don't, I mean, look, I mean, the, the, uh, an extended debate on, on an issue is, a, is not always a winner. Uh, I mean, you've got this, as I said, the strange situation right now where American people don't like the Democratic Congress. They like the Republicans even less, but they dislike the incumbents because they're seeing things not getting done. The Republicans have figured out. They did the first time. I mean, Gingrich was a back picture. Didn't just destroy the, the House of Representatives, the Democrats, but he was going after Bob Michael as well. Um, so there's, there is a, there's unfortunately, uh, oftentimes benefits from just saying, hell no, we're going to stop everything. Um, and, and in fact, there's, you know, I, I, there's a significant number of American people think no is the right answer. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real, if you're sitting down there as a majority leader of the Speaker of the House trying to figure out uh, uh, you know, how, to, how to frame this and carry this argument for it, uh, I'm very sympathetic with it. But every now and then they're going to miss something. Uh, they're going to get it wrong. And uh, it's because it's, they're, they're facing formidable opposition, in my view.
uh, mostly money. I, I think that the money would equal in this campaign would be a much different outcome. Yes, sir. That, of course, everybody has to buy auto insurance because you know there's kind of a social cost involved, and I'm wondering if that would be a simple way of kind of uh, giving a rationale. Done, done a lot. They did that a lot. That was an argument that people made. It was just you know. Well, the difference was yeah. the, the, the the automobile mandates are are, are state-based mandates, so they're not mandates by the federal government. Those are individual states that are mandating it, and it's much easier to make a case that that you're going to get lower costs. You don't have to drive. Well, you don't have to, that's exactly right. That's well, that's Social right. Security is an example of a universal <laughs> program. But this is, look, I, I, I mean, I've uh, had a recent, actually, uh, uh, extensive interview with a, with a, with a, I would say, a left of center youth group. Uh, and they're really angry about the health care bill because they're saying, you know, what do we get in this thing? Uh, except we're having to pay more. Uh, we got a mandate. We got to buy something right now. We don't need, and you're gonna you're gonna spend more money uh, uh, right now on people over the age of 65, and I'm getting less. <coughs> what is that all about? So there's a there is a generational issue going on right now uh, uh, that is one of the reasons that a lot, a lot of young people who were enthusiastic about Obama in 2008 aren't as enthusiastic in 2010. I mean, and it, it's not it's not perception. It's reality. Uh, if, you're, if you're trying to lower the cost for all of us in health care, one of the ways you do it is you bring a large group of people in that are unlikely to be spending money on health care because they're young and they're healthy and uh, we want them in our group uh, uh, because they tend to lower the average cost. It's a whole nature of insurance. Somebody else? Somebody else? Here. Yes, since nothing is certain but death and taxes, what is your prediction what would happen? Because it could happen in spite of your conversation that the Democrats lose seats in the House, lose seats in the Senate, but still maintain control numerically of the House and the Senate. Yes. What would happen? And, and is that good or bad for Obama since he would have nobody to really blame if the Democrats are still in control but, not, but don't have a working majority? Yeah, I, I, my answer would be uh, he's going to be a lot better off if he doesn't lose the House and the Senate. Um, and, and, and in part because uh, I mean, you're going to see congressional investigations up one side and down the other. No, I would like him to maintain control. No, but I mean, when you're, when, when you're in the Congress, uh, if, if, if you and I are on the same committee and I'm the chairman, and you're the ranking, uh, I might tell you uh, when and what the hearings are going to be. Uh, I might give you the opportunity to participate in the decision, but I might not. I don't have to. Uh, and if I decide I'm going to launch and investigate, I'm, I'm, I'm chairman of the finance committee, or I'm chairman of the banking committee, or I'm chairman of you know, the government affairs, uh, something, I, I, can launch, I got the staff, and they'll clean out the Democratic staff, and they'll bring in their People and I think you're going to get a lot of investigations, and you know it's impossible for anybody to be president of the United States and not have something uh, that that that, that, occurred, that they've done. I mean, take mineral management in the interior. You're not going to want to. Obama's not going to want to have Ken Salazar investigated over the next uh, two years, uh, but it's likely to happen. I mean, that's as an example of the sort of thing, and there'll be many more where uh, there's even less evidence. That, that, that some mistake was made. You don't have to actually have a mistake that was made, you just have to have a perception, particularly in this environment, uh, to maybe have an investigation about it. coming from Indonesia to face it. No, no, I, what, what school did he really Oh, go? no, I, I, well, yeah, but that's back to the impact of it. If, 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 if the numbers hold, and the numbers right now predict uh, uh, this change, if the numbers hold, the, 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 the biggest problem that the Republican Party has is you have, you're going to have a significant number of people who got elected with a promise to get to the bottom of whether or not Barack Obama was born in the United States. 20% <laughs> of the American people think he was. Uh, you're, going to get, you're going to get people who promised and keep their promise. Uh, now, I don't know how they're going to have, they're going to have any impact doing it, but they're going, to be, they're going to be working that case. Yes, sir. Somebody, Tom. Uh, Stephen. Right yeah. um, could you uh, 
comment on the role of money in the Tea Party movement and also in the efforts to bring down the Clinton administration, both the right-wing money and right-wing media. It, under Clinton, it was Scape Mellon. Now we have the Koch brothers. We certainly have Murdoch and his media <coughs> empire. Um, well, I, you know, I, I, I think the Tea Party itself is not a creature of money. Uh, I think it's much more a creature of technology than it is a creature of money. Uh, I think the, the, the bigger influx of money, and it's going to be large, and whatever the size of it, it's going to be larger in 2012. Because of a sudden, if, if you're a corporation, your economic and your political interests are aligned. And they're going to be spending a lot of money. If, um, and John and I were talking about the Times and the story about how Republicans might be underfunded, might struggle because they don't have enough money. Uh, they're going to have a lot of money. Because if you're, out, if, you're out, again, if you're out campaigning, if I was out in Nebraska right now campaigning for the Senate, the thing I'm worried about the most is an outside group coming in and buying uh, a thousand gross rating points between now and Labor Day. And today, if I was running in Nebraska, given my political views, there's probably four lines of a thousand gross rating points each, none of which are coordinated with my opponent but all of which are doing significant damage to me uh, with the election. And you're going to see a lot of that uh, between now and, and the election. So I think the, I, mean, I think you're going to get a disproportionate impact of, of money. And again, it, you know, some of it is right wing, some, a lot of it is not right wing. A lot of it is just a business saying it's in my interest. But I mean, let's, let's say that I'm a CEO of a private company, and we manufacture ball bearings in Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, and we pay our workers seven dollars an hour at the minimum wage, and uh, it's in my interest, my economic interest, to spend money uh, supporting people who oppose increasing the minimum wage. Uh, uh, and that's not a right-wing expenditure. Uh, that's a rational economic decision, uh, and I think you're going to see a lot of that uh, uh, in this particular campaign. What do you think, John? I don't think anything different. <laughs> At times. John, what's wrong with the following argument? Let's stipulate, as lawyers say, that November is not going to be a happy month for Democrats. Um, I think what you have been arguing consistently for some time is that there are failures of policy and there are failures of presentation, and by that I don't mean just the rhetoric of the moment, but that Obama, for the reasons you were saying, rested a great deal of his case on his being a capital P progressive, competent guy who is the sort of personification of the rescue from the Bush capacity. Uh, but Obama, the populist, was sort of an assumption made by people who wished that the people would overcome these catastrophes of the eight years of Bush. So let's stipulate that Obama loses the ability to pass significant legislation. And by significant legislation, I mean legislation that actually makes a significant dent in what is, I think we all agree, for the most part, is the decisive question for the Democrats going forward, namely, what is the unemployment rate? So let's suppose that it's a stalemate, that, that, you know, that Obama can veto some, some uh, reactions from the Republicans, but cannot actually get anything done. So where do we go from there? It, would it not, now, that, now the question, would it not be advantageous? <laughs> for Obama to try to polarize, even though this runs counter to his nature, must he not find a way to polarize the situation, to blame the malefactors of that, of, of well, to blame, to blame the crazies with their delusions about where he was born, to blame the, those who want to line the pockets of the top 2%. Um, and to recognize that the game of playing nicey with the two women from Maine, uh, shall we say, these diminishing 
or negative returns. I, I don't uh, disagree with what you said, but uh, I, I don't think Obama's going to do that. I, I, uh, I mean, I think that what he could do within the, the, the limits of how he operates politically is he could start using the federal government and the power of the presidency to do whatever he could about jobs without uh, using necessarily going to the Congress. And there are things which are beyond my pay scale, but they're, that you can do with labor, labor department and so on to do that. Um, I think he, could, he also has to put, put the Republicans in a bind in terms of jobs and the kind of legislation. The Democrats have to do that too. The, you know, the, uh, the Democrats did that uh, to, to, to uh, he, he, they did that to George H.W. Bush in 91. You just, you, they did it to Reagan in 1988. You bring plant closing bills. I mean, you do everything, uh, uh, bills that were against outsourcing. I mean, there's ways to do that to dramatize the issue. Uh, I'm, I'm just not, again, as far as polarizing, uh, it's very, I, it's very alien to him, I think. If, if you read the uh, stories about Summers leaving, uh, the, the uh, you know, the, the gossip uh, in Washington is that uh, Obama's going to replace him with a, uh, a, a female C CEO. Not a small business, which would be one thing, but a, you know, a corporate CEO. Uh, somebody who would uh, remove the impression that the, uh, that the Obama administration is anti-business, which is, again, is an impression, you know, on a few zip codes in New York City and, you know, on the Huntsville, that guy in Huntsville with the minimum wage, but it's not a problem in the country as a whole. So I think they're not thinking in that direction. They're not thinking polarized, uh, uh, but, you know, populism, the point of above. So, yeah, I think you also have to, I mean, uh, you, Bill Clinton was elected in 1992, in no small measure to Ross Perot, but uh, it was also because uh, it wasn't clear that we were, we were out of the recession, even though we were. I mean, you, you look at all the numbers show that uh, before he was inaugurated, uh, we were out of the recession, but it didn't feel like it. So he was able to claim that his 93 budget uh, act really brought us out of the recession, even though it would have been, I think, probably smarter for uh, us to say it began in 1990 and, and praised uh, uh, Herbert Walker Bush for signing that bill in 1990. So all we did is amend the 1990 omnibus budget reconciliation act. We, and, and it have been more effective in 2000 as well, um, uh, or 2004 more, more uh, uh, accurately. Either one of those elections for Gore and or Kerry to turn to him and say, I can understand why you would repudiate Bill Clinton's policy, but I can repudiate your dad's, uh, which is what he would have had to defend. So the fear that I've got is that uh, it's, it's entirely possible that an unemployment rate stays high all the way through the election. It begins to go down in uh, 2011, in part because of what Obama has already done. It began, you began to get traction. And the Republicans are going to claim they did. It's like the dog barking at the moon thinking he produced the moon. Uh, I mean, you'll get that, you'll get a claim uh, that it's because they did something. They'll be aware of that. They're, they'll be very much aware that what they need to do is something to take credit for the likely decline in unemployment. Uh, I, don't know, I don't think it's going to get anywhere near uh, where it needs to be uh, uh, because I don't think there's solutions. But all it needs to do is sort of trend down into 2012, and it makes it easier for them when they're running in 2012. See, uh, Obama didn't get it done. It only started to change when we uh, took power in 2010. Yeah, yeah uh, I want to follow up uh, on the last question, but maybe take it even um, further. Um, if you guys are right in this relatively uh, pessimistic scenario that's being painted here, and I suspect you are, then um, maybe the trick is to think in, in a longer term perspective about what kind of rhetoric and strategy for the Democratic Party now can lay down a, a marker for the future rather than for uh, cutting losses in this immediate uh, election. Now I understand why specific individuals might not want to go this route. 
But it seems to me, I, I wouldn't uh, necessarily call it exactly polarizing, although it would be polarizing, but it seems to me that the whole um, question of uh, mobilizing uh, the base that has been demobilized, that got Obama elected in the first place, turns on a different kind of rhetoric. As soon as you put these arguments about health care, about your guy in Huntsville, Alabama, in terms of narrowly defined economic self-interest, the game is lost. It's not possible to sort of lift it onto another level if that's the ground you're fighting on. What disappointed me the most was the absence of any rhetoric in the healthcare debate of solidarity, of the sort of moral case for mutual responsibility in a, a, a republic, in a nation. What, what, why not mobilize that kind of rhetoric? It's not gonna win in the short term, but let's at least get it out there and begin to build a kind of you know, movement well, that can get Democrats elected in the future, if not I mean, right now. I think you're 100% right. I mean, I, I, and there's a number of places where it can be done. Healthcare is, is the most important one. Uh, rather than, I, I, do, I, and I don't think cost control is the, is the most effective argument. I think your, the moral argument is a much more compelling argument. And, and it could have gone further, in my view, with a moral argument uh, than it was done. Uh, you've got a very similar situation with trade. Uh, I mean, you've got, a, you've got a situation where the steel workers have to file, file a case against uh, China. Businesses were afraid to do it. Uh, and businesses normally provide the data uh, for those kinds of complaints. So there's a, there's a number of areas where I think you can make a moral case that something's going on that just isn't right and it ought to be stopped. It's, it's, it's why I find about the Tea Party Act is quite compelling because they do begin with a moral case. Uh, they organize around the moral case. Uh, so I, I think you're right. Whether it, whether it produces electoral victories in 2012 or not, I don't know. But I think it's the only way, uh, it's the only way forward. Because uh, all the rest of it is just trimming at the margin and running numbers, and it's not—it doesn't—it's not very, not very exciting or fun. Um, I, you know, I, I think that the uh, Obama people actually understood this point at the, you know, in, in uh, January of 2009 or whatever, and um, I, I'm, don't, I'm not going to talk about the moral side of it, but the economic side of it which is that um, we're, we're at a kind of transition point in, in, in our economy where uh, we have these enormous trade deficits. Uh, we have problems in terms of the organization of our cities, transportation. Uh, and they started to talk about the, this kind of green revolution, which uh, not only would respond to uh, global warming, but also would uh, create uh, you know, thousands, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of jobs by transforming the society. Electric cars, uh, high-speed rail. Uh, Obama wanted to, you know, was to, wanted to have, he, this is in Jonathan Alter's book, he wanted to uh, do a smart grid nationally, and then they just figured they couldn't do it because uh, there were too many state regulatory, but that would be something, again, that would, uh, would uh, have a tremendous contribution to the conservation of energy. And you would start to see a kind of new, you know, a new society in, the, in 10, 20, 30 years. So there is that uh, vision. I, I'm not, I, I don't know how to, uh, again, I don't know how to, how to tell them, them or the Democrats to, to put it forth, but, they, but it is around. Uh, it's going to be, it's, you know, it's sort of a lingering issue of, uh, in California between Meg Whitman and uh, Jerry Brown. Uh, they have this proposition that uh, that the uh, your your Coke uh, uh, characters put the, put on the ballot to uh, stop the uh, that really dismantle Schwarzenegger's uh, uh, bill to, that would uh, curb carbon emissions and would uh, continue California's role as the leader in, in uh, green technology and in in, in you know in, in environmental protection and uh, and Whitman. I guess it's tomorrow or the next day, says she's finally going to take a vision. Of course, Brown, that's one of the things, uh, not, you know, whatever you say about him, that, that he's always been really good at and understands. So it's a big issue in California. So I, I don't know. Again, I think that's the, that's, the, uh, that's the core of the future vision. I don't know how to put that forth in a way that's uh, compelling, but that's, you know, I, I can tell you about it. I can't. And maybe almost everybody that could critiqued uh, Vice President Gore's uh, campaign in 2000. So something, you know, we should, they should just let Al be Al. 
And it may be in 2012, you just let Obama be Obama, for God's sakes. And, uh, and, 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 and he will be a formidable candidate. He's an incumbent president, smart as hell, great on his thumb. And he's going to have a lot of ammunition and a lot of capability of exciting uh, people again in 2012. It's, but it's, it's, uh, it's a challenge. And I, think, and I do think thinking about making it a, a, a moral cause is the only way to get through this thing. I mean, well, let me just, one, one other thing I want to say about it. The, the, uh, a lot of the advantage that Roosevelt had in the 30s was that uh, business was to a great extent neutralized uh, by the crash and by, the, by public disfavor. And there really couldn't mount an effective kind of uh, opposition to him. And uh, he was able to, to, to draw the, uh, again, the liberal elites that, uh, that uh, are important for reform, uh, the, the uh, Frankfurter corporate and that group, uh, and uh, was able to, uh, again, put a vision of what the country could be in the, in the future. Uh, if you see what happened to Obama's proposals, they get killed by, you know, this disinterest group there, the, that, and nobody wants to do the uh, global warming, you know, because it's going to hurt jobs. So it was, it's very hard to do now. Uh, and part of the reason is that, that there isn't that kind of sense that we all have to pull together as a nation and do something. And without that, you know, without that, it's, it's, it's hard. We have a much more fragmented society. And these, uh, and these particular interest groups that are just looking out for themselves and don't have a, a, a vision of the greater whole have an inordinate amount of power. Nick, it's very, you know, if you're, if you're looking at 5 or 6% undecided uh, 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 going into the last two weeks of a campaign, um, you know, that, that, uh, that dishonest advertisement that just pounds people to death can carry the day. But it still doesn't take away uh, from, I think, the, the suggestion that you're much better off feeling better the day after, even if you lose, that you've made, you've made the right case and, 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 and attempted to persuade American people to do something that's right, not just for them, but for all of them. Yeah, I think that's the right, and I, I, I think it actually is a source of hope. I'm looking for, 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 for you know, something to cheer those of you who are on the uh, Democratic side of this thing. It is a source of hope. And by the way, I think uh, it's, it's where there's likely to be common ground with, with Republicans. I, I don't think it's just uh, Snow and Collins. I think there are, there are others where a common ground is possible. Lindsey Graham happens to be one of them, where a common ground is possible. Somebody, somebody, somebody over there has a mic. Okay. Um, I'm going to try to express this as simply as possible, but we're talking about causes for optimism, and I think we're talking about, you know, okay, what's wrong with politics today, the involvement of money, the special interest involvement, the polarization and the fracturing of the public onto wedge issues. The issue becomes, how do you galvanize the country around a particular mission, around a particular narrative, something that can transcend these things? Um, you know, these, these various particular policy issues. Um, what is something for, for which there is already data Okay, to support the policy, and which also corresponds and plays right into the main problem that people are worried about right now, which is unemployment. I think the answer to that is, as you start to bring up the Green Revolution, um, the point that Tom Friedman in his op-ed columns that has, you know he's been beating that drum. I think that's the most persuasive solution to basically present climate change as a jobs bill. I can't think of a better time to fundamentally change what our economy is about and position it to be the leader in the next great industry. And I do think that could be green energy. What you have here is an opportunity to say, okay, just like in the 60s with the Cold War, we are going to put a man on the moon in 10 years. Okay, it's about creating a sense of competition against, against Russia. It was about creating a national mission, a narrative of national identity. I think that if there's an issue, if there's a policy that comes closest to that, it would be, we need to beat China in the next great 
innovation of this century, and that's green energy. And if you can tie that to the amount of jobs that just some policy decisions you know, can produce in terms of incentivizing certain investments, why isn't that message Resonating. I mean, well, I, I can answer that. I mean, actually, I, mean, I think, I think, I think Obama's done a relatively good job on that. But a piece of this message is going to have to acknowledge that uh, if you, if you, want, if, if, if you decide you want to uh, create some jobs, um, my guess is there'll be a half a dozen government agencies you've got to get permission from before you can create a single job. So one thing Democrats have to acknowledge is there, are, there, there is a real issue with regulation and paperwork and the, and the nuisance that you find yourself facing when you're, when you're trying to do what the politicians say that they want to do. Whether it's green jobs or red jobs or whatever the colors are, uh, you've got to get permission. You've got to maintain that permission. So, uh, I, because it, and there's a lot of stuff in the environmental movement uh, where you can actually use the marketplace uh, a, a lot more effectively rather than uh, having a one-size-fits-all strategy. So I have to think in that particular area, uh, the Democrats are not going to win, no matter how strong, and I think you have to make the climate change, unless you make a moral case, you're not going to win it. Uh, but when you get down to the details of the economic strategy, uh, you know, you're going to have to allow, you're have to allow people to run the risk of uh, uh, doing what they think is right and you know, succeeding, failing, and you have to minimize the and the, the regulatory friction, they just aren't going to do it. The risk associated with doing it just keep going up and up and up. I, I, I apologize in the back room they're going like this, and I know there's lots of other questions, and, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm apologizing. I'm probably John, but getting out of here, getting out of here.